So today I'm going to talk about uh, Witham's equations and I'm going to present uh, some, some results which are like old and some results which are new. And uh, all of them have been done in collaboration with uh, Alberto Enciso, who is at ICMAT in, in Madrid, in Spain, and Bruno Vergara, who is uh, at the University of Barcelona. Okay, so, so this is a short summary of, of the talk. Oh wait, we don't see the slides. Uh, I passed the slides, but I don't see. Uh, what's going on? You don't see slide like page two, right? We don't. We don't see this. The second slide. Okay, so something is not working. Then let's do the following. Let's uh, because I I can see it on my iPad, but it's not. Okay, so. This is strange. This is really the first time that it has happened. Um, the, let me then like connect with the with the laptop. Sorry about that. Uh, it always happens when you. I think that should work now. Yeah, we can see your slides. Yep. Okay. Then let me just also disconnect the iPad. Okay, so I won't be able to draw, but uh, but at least it will be like more stable at the very least. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to present a new strategy to construct uh, solutions of PDE, in particular singular solutions or solutions with very low regularity that are typically obtained at the uh, endpoints of bifurcation branches. So you do local bifurcation, you sort of get out of the trivial solution, the constant solution or any like trivial solution, you follow the branch and then uh, the branch stops at that point. And typically that point has something bad going on, which could be potentially loss of regularity. Okay, so, so the whole point is to construct specifically those solutions which can be found at the endpoints of, of those branches. And I am also going to talk about how to prove uniqueness of, of those kind of solutions, even in the cases where there is no like maximum principle available or, or I don't know, any elliptic theory to, to help out. Uh, the ideas are going to be very basic. I'm not claiming that the ideas are deep, but this is just a new use of, of, um, of simple ideas. And I'm going to obtain also, as a byproduct of the construction, qualitative information of, of the solution. Um, part of the proof is going to be computer assisted, and I will explain where and how it is done. And this is not specific to, to any equation in particular, so this is a very general framework, and it can be also applied to other, to other bad situations where you have instability, or where you have like low regularity problems or ill post problems. Uh, and so on. And something that we've learned throughout this, throughout this journey is that in the beginning we were very afraid and we didn't like uh, special functions at all. But with time we've come to sort of uh, come to terms with them and we are sort of in a low hate, hate relationship with uh, special functions. And right now I think they are pretty useful. So, so I will explain how, how they end. Okay, so I'm interested in constructing singular solutions or waves um, of greatest height. And uh, these waves of greatest height typically develop some kind of singularity in the form of a corner or, or a cusp, <coughs> depending on the equation. Okay, and uh, I want to study um, traveling waves uh, over, over a flat bed. So, so the starting point is to say, well, let's take KDB, um, but this is not really going to work well in this setting because um, it really doesn't capture like this, some of these phenomena. So wave breaking, um, sharp crests, or in general, like any sort of non-smooth solutions, and these are not, not captured by, by KDB. So instead, uh, let's see, well, let's look at Euler. And uh, if we look at the Euler equation, then the symbol of the linear part is this hyperbolic tangent uh, of C over C, the square root of that. 
and KDB is obtained by using a second, by taking a second degree approximation um, when the frequencies are small. So if the frequencies are small, then, then one uh, approximates this symbol and gets exactly KDB. Okay, so the suggestion, which was done by Witham, was to say, well, instead of approximating it for, for small frequencies, just take the full symbol. So Witham proposed the following equation, which is um, some kind of dispersive perturbation of burgers, where um, the dispersive part, instead of taking three derivatives as in KDB, one has like the multiplier given by this uh, hyperbolic tangent of xi over xi. So then for small frequencies and small times, then the Witham equation and the KDB are going, to, are going to work in the same way. However, for large frequencies, then this is a very different behavior because now we have a, a, very, a very weak dispersive per perturbation of burgers um, with a symbol of size uh, xi to the one half. Okay, so this is, this is what uh, Witham proposed and the, the top equation is known as the Witham equation. Um, so now with, with this equation, then, <coughs> okay, this is now non-local. It is inhomogeneous due to the hyperbolic tangent and it is, and it is fractional. So for this equation, um, the local well poseness theory is um, standard, but the global well poseness is still open. Um, there are traveling waves, which were constructed first in 2009 by Enstrom and Gallish using local bifurcation. There are also solitary waves um, in a paper by Enstrom, Groves, and Valen. Um, Klein and Sot did numerics, and uh, they were seeing some, some kind of blow up, um, which um, seems to be self similar. And they were also developing like some conjectures related to how the blow up is done and, and how it happens. Um, Berahur proved the uh, wave breaking, so that means that the solution stays in L infinity, but the, um, the derivative blows up. And there is a very recent paper of a few weeks ago by uh, Tien Truong, Eric Valen, and Miles Wheeler, where using center manifold theory, they can prove the existence of solitary waves of, of greatest half. Okay, so Witam in 1967 had the following conjecture. So Witam <coughs> Using formal uh, arguments, he conjectured that there was a limiting traveling wave. Um, and moreover, that limiting traveling wave had uh, C1 half regularity. Okay, so then now 50 years later, um, Ernstrom and Valen proved the conjecture using global bifurcation theory. Um, and the proof um, gives existence, but is not constructive. So in the same paper, and um, they, they conjecture that the, that the limiting wave was everywhere convex. And here, when I say convex, I mean between crest and trough, the wave, um, the wave is even, so it cannot be convex everywhere. Um, and moreover, the asymptotic behavior was given in the moving frame by this um, x to the one half term, which was the one conjectured by Witham, but that the next term had to be little o of x. Okay, and here mu, is going to be part of the problem, and it also has to be found. Mu is the mu is the wave speed. Okay, um, just to compare a little bit the um, situation between the Stokes waves, which is the column on the left, and uh, uh, and the Witham equation. So for the Stokes waves, uh, everything is known between existence, convexity, and uh, and uniqueness, and it was first proved in the 80s by Amik Frankel and Toland and Plondikov and Toland. Um, who later showed the convexity. And the uniqueness was proved by Kobayashi about 30 years later. So th the point is that the time frame here is 30 years, or almost 30 years between the first proof and the last proof. Whereas in the right column, um, we have managed to, to do it in about five years. So um, Bruno visited me in 2017 at, uh, when I was at Princeton, and we started working on this, and we have managed to to prove all of them. So uh, we are going to prove uniqueness. Uniqueness implies local uniqueness. So today I'm going to discuss the second row and the fourth row on the right column. Okay. Um, so this is the first theorem, <coughs> which is essentially what I said. Um, so there exists a, a traveling wave, which is the highest cusp um, traveling wave. And here highest means the, the height between crest and trough, which is convex, C1 half, and it has the asymptotics um, conjecture by Enstrom and, uh, and Valen. And in the middle, you see a cartoon where um, 
about how, how the waves look like when we move throughout the branch. So we start being flat, then um, we sort of uh, start creating a little, uh, a little bump, and then eventually the wave grows until it hits the, the point where it loses regularity. Okay, and this point is at the end of that branch. Okay, so let me, let me show how the proof, or let me sketch how the proof is done in that case. The first step is to remove time at all, work in the moving frame, um, and then if we do so, then <coughs> the Witham equation becomes this middle equation, L phi plus some quadratic part is equal to zero, and L phi is the operator coming from the, from the multiplier. Okay, so Witham, in his book, sort of uh, counted powers, and he argued that the, um, that the crest had to be x2 on half, because the symbol gains um, a half of a derivative. So if the left term is like, if phi is like x to the beta, then the left term has to be x to the beta plus a half, and the right term is x to two beta, and if they compensate, then beta has to be one half. Okay, so by this sort of power counting arguments, then one can postulate that, <coughs> that the regularity or that the asymptotics at zero have to be um, the power one half. Okay, so now let's get rid of the, of the velocity first. So let's subtract the, this term mu two and then use the symmetries uh, and we end up with a simple equation with a bad sort of multiplier. So it looks nice, it looks simple. U squared is equal to LU but of course L becomes uh, much more complicated. And now it is this integral where K is related to the, to the multiplier with the hyperbolic tangent. Um, but the upshot is that once we solve for U, we can recover mu. So if, if we find U, then we can find mu. Okay, that's good. That's one less thing we have to deal with. That's one less thing we have to solve for. So now let's see if we can solve this equation in terms of, in terms of U. Okay, and the main idea is, is this one, which is very simple. So um, construct any way you want uh, an approximation you not. And uh, the any way you want is literally any way you want. Um, and, then, and then solve for u being equal to that, that uh, approximation that, that you guessed plus a perturbation. And the hope is that if you guess right and if you guess well, then the, the perturbation has to be very small. So now if we write down the equation as a linear part acting on the perturbation equal to a nonlinear part um, plus a defect, remember u naught is explicit, so u naught square plus l u naught is a given function. Um, <coughs> and we can invert the linear part onto the right hand side. Then, then we seem to be winning because the right hand side is epsilon square plus delta. And, um, and if all the constants work, somehow in our favor, then this is bounded by epsilon and we can apply a fixed point argument, right? So then we would close, we would map u bar to the inverse of the left-hand side acting on the right-hand side. And if all the numbers are small enough, then we would gain. And uh, the point is that if we close and u bar is very small, then uh, if u naught is uh, strictly convex, then u bar is not going to destroy the convexity. So then u, which is u naught plus u bar, will, will, still, will still be kept complex. Okay, so this is, this is the, main, the main idea. And now, okay, there were like big ifs in, in this proof, which can be summarized, summarized here. So if we can construct a good u naught, and if we can prove that the linear part is invertible, and if the constants are small enough, then we win. So now I'm going to talk about how to do steps one and steps two. Okay, so how would one start to, to do a good, a good approximation? Well, the first thing is to figure out what is the right behavior at zero. So one starts doing formal asymptotics. Okay, so <coughs> if one starts doing formal asymptotics, then, okay, difficulties start to happen. The first one is that, well, sure, the first term is like x to the one half, but then the next one seems to be some complicated number which is not rational, it's, um, it's a solution of an equation, but, um, but then it's sort of hard to sort of figure out what the next ones are and even find what, what this number is. There is no closed, there is no closed expansion for, for that. Uh, 
And on top of that, if one tries to substitute for these kind of functions into the equation, then the error is pretty big. So the error overall, the vertical, the vertical axis is the error, is about 10 to the minus 3. Okay. And to make matters worse, if one puts powers into, into the multiplier, then, um, then it's pretty tough to, to get like an accurate approximation of the multiplier acting on, on such a function, like x to some, to some power alpha. Okay. So <laughs> the first thing we, we thought was, well, sure, we can maybe add some smooth terms to this and correct the error on, on the tail and maybe lower it down a little bit. So, so that was our idea, but that didn't work or at least that didn't work to the extent that we needed. Um, and instead of that, we sort of discovered or were discovered some, some new basis or some new function to, to do this numerics. So now I'm sort of advocating from the point of view of the numerics to, for these functions, which are special functions. So instead of picking a Fourier basis, uh, which would be just cos nx or sine nx, then we decided to pick these uh, Clausen functions, C set and S set, um, which are actually very nice because they are periodic. Um, they are singular at zero with a singularity controlled by Z, and they interact very well with, um, with power, power multipliers. So never mind the hyperbolic tangent, if we had like a multiplier which was one over uh, C to some power, and uh, apply it to a Clausen function, then we would get another Clausen function with a different exponent. And on top of that, the gain in performance is massive, is really massive. So by just putting 10 of these, we were beating our previous calculations with 5,000 Fourier modes by a factor of 1,000. So not, not just in terms of like the, the speed of calculation, which is of course much faster, but, uh, but in terms of the performance, we were, we were getting errors which were of the size of 10 to the minus three, um, better, even better, just with 10. So now the way we construct the approximate solution is by some combination of these uh, special functions to, to get a good behavior towards zero, plus some smoothing terms um, to sort of dive, drive the tails down, okay? And as I said before, the powers are not nice numbers, they solve this equation, um, which I wrote on the bottom, and they cannot be found in closed form. Okay, so that makes, uh, makes the whole thing a little bit more unpleasant. Okay, and then we can choose <coughs> in this basis function, we can choose the coefficients multiplying the basis functions just by solving a, a nonlinear system. So that's not, that's not too hard, and we can, find, we can find good coefficients that have, um, that have small error. So this is how the error looks like. And you can see on the left that we are now at the size of 10 to the minus seven. Okay, so, and I will get, get back as to why we need a 10 to the minus seven error. Okay, so that, that, that looks promising. Uh, we can figure out an approximate solution with about 20 modes and, uh, and the error is small, nice. Um, so how to do the linear part, how to show that the linear part is invertible. Well, the first observation, keep in mind that we, we want to invert the identity minus one over two U naught L, okay? But here I'm going to discuss only one over two U naught L. So the first observation is that uh, even though the operator is compact, it's not so much about the regularity at this point, but about the, um, about the behavior towards zero. So it's more of a size issue. Um, the point is that if we apply this operator to X to the N, we recover X to the N. So there is no hope to bootstrap in, in that context or to gain like an improvement on, <coughs> on the regularity. And this is precisely because we are at the, at the limiting weight. So if we work um, and we write down what the operator uh, looks like and we write it as a kernel acting on F and we work with weighted L infinity, then the norm of this operator is given by the L1 L infinity uh, mixed norm. And it turns out that this norm, which uh, has to be smaller than one, remember that we want to invert the identity minus this operator, turns out to be 0.9973. Okay, so, so now it is getting clear why we, and this is, this is the true result. There is, no, there is no upper bounding here. This is exactly what the, the, the norm of this operator is like, and there is an explicit formula for that. And it turns out that it's smaller than one, but just barely. Um, so, 
now one can see the need about why uh, we need to do all these using a computer assisted truth. If we wanted to do analytic estimates and we wanted to do estimates on the size of the numbers, then our margin is extremely thin. Um, so it's about three times 10 to the minus three, which is very, uh, very small. Okay, so nonetheless, we can, we can do it and show that this operator is invertible, but even though it may, invert, it may be invertible, the norm of the inverse is, is big because this operator has norm very close to one. So this norm, this 300 here, square actually, we have to beat it with the norm coming from the defect. So that's why we needed to be like the unit to be so precise and to solve the equation so well, because we have to beat this number 380 here. And if you look at how the integral of K naught looks like, this is sort of how it looks like. So um, even though it looks like one, and I was thinking that it was one for some time, it turns out that this is actually 0.9973. Okay, so, so this is um, what we do, and this is sort of the, the number that we bound, but the number is sharp. I mean, it's, it's the actual norm. So uh, in order to prove it, then we sort of split the kernel into two parts. The close to or the small x part is done by hand by doing asymptotics at zero uh, to avoid like zero over zero situations. And uh, there are many terms. And in the large part, we do rigorous bounds and we do um, interval arithmetics to compute the, to compute the integral for, for large x or for not small x. And in order to do so, for the asymptotics, we also exploit the fact that the, that the kernel <coughs> looks like one over square root of x plus some smoother term, which we are able to, to bound. Okay, so this is sort of how the proof works um, for, uh, for, for the computation of the norm of the linear operator. And then once we do that, then we recast our system as a fixed point um, system. We put the weight x for the moment, and then we can close. And the numbers, the numbers are good enough, the error is small, and we can close. But uh, this would only prove the existence of a solution with, um, with the behavior x, like big O of x, but not little o of x. And to go from big O of x to little o of x, we use that all the conditions are open conditions. So if we perturb in the weight a little bit, then, um, then the conditions are, are still going to hold true if the perturbation is small enough in the weight. So now we can, we can set a weight, which is one plus epsilon and uh, go to little o of x. And then the, the, rest of the, the rest of the proof goes through because there is, even though there is very little margin, there is still some margin, okay? So that would be a proof of the existence, but just in a C0 space. In order to go from C0 to C2, then we take derivatives of the equation, suffer, and, uh, and prove sort of similar estimates, but now with more complicated operators. The numbers are still pretty bad. Like this number 0.9976 um, appears throughout the whole calculations at the level of zero, one, and two derivatives. Um, but the upshot is that we are not really the, using the equation too much. But of course, if the numbers are very small, there is, no, there is no chance or we don't see any other way to do it other than using a, using a computer assisted proof. Okay, so now let me move on to the uh, uniqueness part. So this is the, <coughs> this is the new theorem. Um, um, the, it says the following, so the Witham equation has a unique, even, and two pi periodic traveling wave um, solution of greatest height, which is not increasing in, in zero pi. And the picture here is, it's sort of important because it's related to the proof. So there are two things that one has to remember. I would write them down, but, um, but keep that in mind. The first one is that the pink one is something very close to the solution. And uh, keep in mind the behavior at zero. At zero, it has to be uh, 0 0.60 something. Okay. This is the solution divided by square root of x, by the way. Um, so, so at zero, it has to be 0 0.60 something. And then everything in a color which is not pink is either an upper bound or a lower bound on the solution. And I'll get to that. Okay, but keep in mind this number 0 0.6. Okay. So how is the proof going to work? 
the main idea again is is very simple. So obtain an upper bound and a lower bound and try to get it better using that knowledge. So try to do some kind of bootstrapping using the knowledge that you have about about the solution and then do so many many times until you're close enough and then run a fixed point argument because now you're in a very small neighborhood of the solution and then the fixed point argument um, may work okay so so this is how the proof is going to work and um, and again we're going to use the computer because to get the improvements are really tiny so if we ever try to do any of these iterations um, by hand or by doing analytical estimates, um, then we, we would fail because the, the improvements are extremely small every time we sort of make one iteration of, of, of our method. Um, and as I said before, the operator doesn't, doesn't satisfy monotonicity properties and it doesn't satisfy uh, maximum principles. And the contractivity is only true if we are sufficiently close to the solution. So if we try to run some kind of fixed point argument, some kind of <laughs> contraction mapping argument in a big region it will not work uh, because we're not we're not close enough to the solution so so let's start remember that our function or our equation was u squared equals lu so now let's work in this weighted space divide by the weight x to the one half and uh, and split the operator l into the positive part which i'm going to call f and the negative part, which I'm going to call G. So the, the positive part is just the integral between um, some Y of X, um, and the negative part is the, is the rest. So the, the integrand only changes sign once at the point which we cannot, cannot solve for, I mean, at least analytically, um, which we're going to call Y of X, okay? So <coughs> this, is, this is our operator, and uh, F is positive and G is positive. Um, but it comes with, an, with a negative sign. Okay, so, so let's see what else we can do. Um, so the proof is going to work in the following way, um, roughly. We're going to first prove a priori bound uh, to get the, the u naught or the w naught plus and the w naught minus. And then um, use the assumption on the monotonicity on u um, and iterate those bounds until, until we can, until the, the whole thing doesn't saturate. The, the, the problem here is that if we iterate those bounds, then somehow they, they saturate after a while. And then there is no improvement and we'll see what we have to do then. Um, and well, what we do is what I, what I outlined in bullet three, um, which is change the operators, move on to a different basis um, and then take a very big finite approximation of, uh, of the nonlinear system and, uh, and work there. So part three is going to be machine heavier to some extent. I will explain um, all of them. Okay, so <coughs> this is an example, for example, of how to obtain a priori bounds. Remember W square was equal to FW minus GW. So let's throw away the GW and, uh, and uh, W squared is then bounded by, um, by FW. And uh, therefore we can bound W by F of one. So that's, that's an honest upper bound, um, pretty bad by the way, but, uh, but certainly some upper bound. Okay, so this gives some, some bound W naught plus, which is um, equal to some number 0.84 plus something linear. And keep in mind, as I said, that the goal is to reach at zero, uh, 0.6. Okay, and we can work a little more and uh, get, a, get a lower bound in W, depending on some parameter. And if we optimize, then we get something which is like 0.2. Okay, so, um, so that's not bad to start with. And then we would think, well, let's run the square root and then take take the worst case, which is when we apply the positive part um, to the smallest and the negative part to the biggest, and uh, which is the worst case, and, um, and then keep going from there. But, but the problem is that with those numbers, um, the thing which is inside the radical is negative. So, so the a priori bounds are not good enough 
to start um, to start to run this scheme. Uh, I mean, the upper bound there is no problem, but the lower bound uh, still has still has issues because we cannot run the argument because the thing inside um, inside the root is negative. Let alone it will improve on our bounds. I mean, we cannot even start, so we cannot even think about improving improving the bounds, and this is bad. Okay, so we need to work more and find something that is going to act in place of what what I denoted here by J. We need to find some substitute for J, at least in this regime. Um, and the good news is that we can find it. Uh, we can find a new operator J tilde, um, which works well in this regime, and it exploits the, the monotonicity in, in a nice way uh, by studying like the integral operator and splitting it into certain pieces. So I'm going to skip the details, but the point is that with that operator J tilde, we can get the better bounds, um, 0.33 and 0.73, which are um, good enough to, to, to let J run. But of course, um, we cannot do this indefinitely. And this is about the point where, where the method or where the operator J tilde saturates. If we, keep, if we keep applying J tilde, then we don't gain. So, so we apply J tilde until we saturate, we get 0 0.33, 0 0.73, and uh, magically we are in a position where we can apply J um, from that point on. Okay, so this is, this, just this part of the proof with the operator J um, has some resemblance with, um, with the part for, for the Stokes wave, um, but of course the operator for Stokes is a lot easier. And the idea is to say, well, let's take now step functions. Let's uh, discretize our system, or let's pretend that, um, that our system is approximately the following finite dimensional, big, n is big, and it's on the order of um, a few thousands. Um, and then <coughs> we're going to discretize our system into uh, piecewise constant functions. So, so our basis functions is going to be just a piecewise constant supported in a small interval, xj minus one xj, and then we're going to discretize the operator f and the operator g acting on those acting on those functions. So we have a big matrix, modulo errors. So all the errors are, are going to be taken into account, and then iterate through through those matrices. Now the gain here is really really minimal, but um, but the advantage is that the iterations will be done by the computer. So we're going to be doing um, many iterations and then the gain is substantial. So now the, but the problem is that if n is big, um, then there are many integrals to compute. Remember that, that both f and g are integral operators. So we actually had to, had to compute n squared integrals. And if n is a um, thousand or two thousand, then we are talking here that we have to compute four million integrals. Um, so that's bad from the computational point of view. Um, but there are, uh, um, there, are, there are shortcuts. And uh, it turns out that some of the integrals that we have to calculate can be approximated by Fresnel integrals. And then Fresnel integrals are implemented in a way that one can compute them much faster than like a genetic integral. So, so now we can see that <coughs> this discretization of both F and G um, we can write it as uh, some sum of Fresnel integrals, and this will speed up the calculation. So now having 4 million of those is not as scary as, as before. And as a bonus, we don't even, like we don't only have to deal with Fresnel integrals, but also with uh, hypergeometrics, um, hypergeometric 2 f one functions as well. And this is just to, to speed up the calculation of, of those integrals. Okay, so this is how the picture looks like now. Um, the a priori bounds are not picture, but then the, the bounds with um, the first operator um, put us into the blue, uh, in between the blue curves. And now by doing this finite dimensional projection, we have managed to go from blue to red, but there is still a long way to go from red to pink. Nonetheless, um, the operator that was saturating before at the blue curve, it turns out that at the red curve, it does gain again. Um, so, so even though the finite dimensional project, projection saturates at the red, now we can pick up the previous operator again, apply it again, and then uh, the red is going to improve. So we are sort of swapping 
operators until they until they saturate and by doing that little by little um, we can go from the red to the pink so now we are at the pink and we are in a very small neighborhood of where the true solution should lie um, so that's what they say after one last refinement we get sharp bounds and this correspond to to the pink one now the, the last part of the proof is to prove a fixed point here so now <coughs> We are in a setting where we can where we can set it up um, because it maps the space onto itself. Um, so we would win if this um, if this constant c or calligraphic c was um, less than one. So then uh, then we would be in a position where we can apply the uh, fixed point a fixed point argument. Um, but it turns out that uh, c is one point one. So, so, so we fail. Okay, so life is hard and we have to work um, a little more. And we cannot set it up exactly this way. So we cannot set, set it up in this space X. We have to change the space a little. And we can do that by adding an extra weight. So if we add an extra weight A, um, uh, this is the same changing the norm in x is changing uh, is, is the same as changing the space x so if we now work with this norm with this weight a um then it does happen that the operator square root of l is contractive and we can we can apply um, a fixed point argument so now we use Banach's fixed point theorem and uh, we find uh, the existence and the uniqueness of one solution in that tiny strip um of uh, pink color and, uh, and then, and then we are done. This this would give uniqueness in in this class. So just to summarize, uh, we are using heavily that u is monotone, and we have proved the existence of a unique function which is even monotone and convex. And uh, both solutions in both parts are the same. And we can we can write the solution in the in the moving frame as um, <coughs> u square plus um, some constant times x to the um, x to the half so this is what they wanted to say thank you very much